Good morning all. Uh, today we're here to talk about um, ETF and index funds and answer or discuss the question, active, passive or both, what's best? Now, uh, active and passive management is a hotly debated topic amongst most investors. Um, which approach is best or is a blend of the two really the option to go down? So um, what I'll do now is just pass over to each of our panelists to briefly introduce us. Uh, introduce themselves before we dive into the questions. So, uh, Richard, would you like to start? Hi, morning everybody. Uh, I'm Rick Lakai. I'm the Global Chief Investment Officer of State Street Global Advisors. Uh, we have a long history in the indexing business, but in ETFs in particular, uh, having launched Spider, the big, the big uh, US-based ETF in 1993. Um, I'm very happy to talk about ETFs. We also run an active business. I'm very proud of what we're able to do in Alpha as well. Uh, so I hope we can have a really good, balanced uh, discussion about this. Excellent. Thank you, Richard. Uh, Jürgen, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, very similar to Richard, um, because um, I work for Goldman Sachs uh, within the ETF team. Um, so my name is Jürgen Bloomberg, and I'm responsible for the capital markets team in Europe. And we are an ETF team within an active manager as well. And it will be a very interesting uh, discussion, I think. Great. Thank you, Jürgen. Uh, and now over to you, Joe. Hi, everyone. Yeah. Um, me? Yeah, oh, sorry, yeah, go on, Jack. Jack, sorry, Joe. And just, I am Jacques Masson, I am the founder of Gate Investment Managers. Um, one of the pillars of my company will be to advise uh, institutionals on, on trying to trust in the ETF the space, uh, mainly how to use actively passive bricks uh, on, I, I, to, Perhaps answer to your question, it's, I would say both, active on, active on passive will be the, the, the solution. Great, thank you, Jack. And uh, finally, over to, over to you, Jack. Thank you. Uh, pleasure to be here. My name is Joe Park, and I'm responsible for the banks and digital channels at uh, BlackRock. Uh, I actually uh, am responsible for across products, uh, both investment and technology. Um, so very looking forward to this, uh, this debate today. Thank you, thank you, Joe. Um, right, so to, so to kick off the questions, I will, uh, uh, I'll start with you, Richard, if that's okay. Um, in your opinion, what are the limitations of indexing? It's a question people have been asking for the last 30 plus years, certainly since I've been involved in, in the asset management business. Um, and I think people in equities originally painted this sort of dystopian picture of it gets too big and who's going to set prices. Um, in reality, markets always have a way of solving this. And I think often in markets, what's not indexed becomes much more focused and active. And I think that gives us quite a long runway in terms of further growth path for, for indexing. Um, I think the other way that people think about limits is liquid versus illiquid assets or efficient markets versus inefficient. And I think the, you know, the received wisdom for a while was if you can, you know, index really efficient liquid markets, but the less liquid or less efficient markets, you should really let that be the domain of active management. And I've got a lot of sympathy with that argument, but unfortunately the facts often point in the opposite direction. Uh, sometimes those markets that are inefficient, for example, emerging market debt, um, have very high trading costs. They also have a lot of beaters implicit in the, the active managers um, techniques and whether it's the liquidity premium, the credit premium, or other premium, you know, a lot of the value added um, that comes from active management often is assigned to those premium. So I guess as we peel back the onion and look deeper and deeper, what we see is a lot of those simple answers actually aren't very true. And in fact, indexing has been, I wouldn't say limitless, but certainly much more flexible and adaptable and useful than we perhaps would think it'd be. I think when you get into private markets, it's a different story entirely, um, but who knows what the future might hold. And I think we need to think what we're getting when we as investors buy into private credit or liquid markets or other things, strip it back and say, what are you really getting? And can you reproduce some of that with index funds? So they're a useful tool and they continue to be a tool that's developing um, and challenging what can be a little bit sometimes a lazy orthodoxy when it comes to markets. Um, would anyone else like to, to uh, add, add on to what Richard has, has said? Uh, just, uh, I'm, I'm 
many fully agree. It just uh, now the the issue as investor, I think it's uh, the ETF is a very useful uh, wrapper to put anything on many uh, everything inside. But the real issue is uh, the liquidity of the underlying. Um, if there is any mismatch between the liquidity looks like ETF um, provided by the ETF on the illiquidity of the underlying, I think that this, mis this, this mismatch could, uh, could be a reason of some disillusion in the, in the ETF space, um, not due to the ETF wrapper, it just because if we put inside very actively managed stuff or illiquid assets uh, inside, I think uh, investors could be disappointed uh, by the results. Um, the, we, are, we have a distortion in the perception of the risk currently due to central banks and so on, where the, everyone are thinking that the risk is free. Um, is not the case. Um, we saw that in, uh, in, 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 in February or March this year. It's some, some ETN, for example, had some issues. Um, um, I think that it's dangerous to think that we, could, we, put, we can put everything in ETF wrapper. And then we need to separate clearly mainly the liquidity of the underlying. Thanks, Jack. Um, sorry guys, before I move on actually, I will just mention that I've realised that I've forgotten to mention to the audience as well that there is a uh, live Q&A at the end of this as well, so please feel free to send through questions um, as anything comes to mind. Um, moving on, Jürgen, I will uh, ask you a question. How do you fit active and passive funds into a portfolio? Yes, thank you. Uh, we think that uh, both uh, fit together very well and I think the academic studies over the years have suggested to blend active and ETFs uh, produces a better risk return profile. And this can create very strong portfolios for clients. And what we see in reality is exactly that. So we see, especially as managers, we see a lot of private banks, we see pension funds as well. They consume ETFs and active funds at the same time or mandated strategies which are managed actively. And we see this as well on the insurance side, and we see it more and more on the retail side as well, where retail clients um, have um, investments into active products, uh, which they know very well, where they follow, for example, the, the fund manager as well. And then they have a savings plan um, where they put uh, money monthly into um, ETFs as well. So I think a blend of both um, is definitely very successful. And the positive side is that investors can choose from thousands of products meanwhile, on the ETF side and on the active fund side as well. And I think the key advantage, uh, what, what Jacques just mentioned as well, of active funds um, is that, um, that some asset classes are less accessible via ETFs. And I'm thinking about infrastructure, for example, or maybe at present at least absolute return strategies or risk premium strategies. And that's where I'm very keen to learn later more from, from Jacques um, on these topics potentially. And in the ETF space, um, you have very transparent and cost-efficient solutions. You have core building blocks uh, like US large cap or global bond, which are very easy to access, uh, which are um, very cost-efficient as well. And you have um, access to some razor sharp topics like for example, cloud computing, or when I think about Chinese bonds. So asset classes which are um, very specific and which have not been accessible before in, in that narrow space. And that's all accessible via ETFs as well. I think that <clears throat> the accessibility of ETFs is very appealing to investors. Um, you can access throughout the day um, at, uh, on exchange, for example, when the OTC market, you can trade a net asset value as well. So this has a key appeal that uh, you are more flexible to get in and out. And in, in, in summary, I just want to say that I think there's a lot of um, active decision-making in both. Um, you actively take the decision um, which product you want to invest in and you time your decision very actively. And I think investors choose to distribute their capital across different vehicles. And when I think about tracking error, for example, for, for benchmark investors, um, they might want to allow tracking error in some areas and might want to choose an active investment um, to, to achieve that. 
and for other ones, uh, they might want to limit um, their tracking error and then they choose a passive vehicle. And I think the correlation of these excess returns across different strategies is very important uh, to manage, especially for um, professional investors. And, and there are at present developments on the active ETF side, and this will be very interesting to follow because it can bring elements from both sides um, together. And um, we as a company, um, as, as many others do obviously as well, we have a dedicated portfolio construction team, which is set up to help investors build strong portfolios using active funds and ETFs all together. Thank you, Jürgen. And so um, just to carry on from that, you mentioned a blend of the two. Do you have a specific view on what that blend should be? Should it be like a satellite portfolio as in, I don't know, 80% ETF and 20% active management or do you, do you have a, a specific view on that? Yeah, so, so from our side, um, I think it very much depends on the, on the demands of the clients. Um, so we see definitely that um, people have a core satellite um, portfolio, whereas it's, it needs to be debated if the core is then, um, for example, um, core building blocks in, in ETFs and then satellites um, of having active funds, or if you choose to have core investments into managers really like on the active side and then uh, do satellites of investment themes, for example, with ETFs. Um, but many different styles are possible as well. So I think it highly depends. We have clients, um, they have 95% in active and the rest in ETFs and we have the other way around. And when I look into the robot advisor space, it's often that they consume 100% ETFs and any, anything exists on this wide spectrum, I think. Okay. Great, thanks. Thanks, Jürgen. Uh, would any, uh, anyone like to, to add on to what Jürgen said? Yeah, I think I think one thing to bear in mind, you know, when thinking about active and passive is um, fees. Um, you know, if you have a fee budget, you've got to think carefully about where you spend that fee budget. Uh, and that might tip the balance both in terms of where you deploy active management, but also how much. And then stepping back, you know, where are your returns going to come from? If you've got a target to achieve, let's say, LIBOR plus 3%, you know, how much do you want that to come from betas? you know, credit, equity, et cetera, liquidity, how much do you want it to come from alphas? And that's a little bit of saying how, how effective are you at finding active managers and being a good owner of active managers? Because we know that active management's quite hard. You have drawdowns, you maybe got to stick with it. Um, and you're finding active managers in a capacity constrained environment is also really hard. And so some people shouldn't really go much for active Others are in a much better position to do so and should maybe put more into active. Very valid point. On the, uh, if, if, if I may, I think that uh, I'm really uh, a strong believer that now the new asset allocation, mainly not only for retired net worth, but from even some pension fund now currently, they are the 60 40 bonds equity now is, seems like useless, I should say. Uh, now it's more liquid on illiquid asset, I should say that we have a kind of beta management part. Mainly you can put only ETFs on that because it's cheap, it's liquid if you select well. And after you can mirror this asset allocation into illiquid strategies. For example, if you have 30% of equities, you can have a, a layer, different layers of ETF and you mirror these 30% in private equity. You do this in bonds, in commos, and so on. I call this the uh, mirror, the beta. Like that, you have the mix and beta and alpha. And you have uh, less volatility, of course, you have a constraint in terms of liquidity, but it's uh, more stable on the long run. Or you can keep the beta through ETF, and after you can create a kind of term structure in the alternative depending of the um, assumption on, on the needs of the clients in terms of uh, asset and liabilities management, I should say. For example, if you want to have you know, the maximum cash uh, received in, in four years, uh, in, in two four years, uh, you select the right alternative strategies able to have the exits or, or get, getting back your cash in four years, for example. And you keep your beta uh, fully liquid uh, respecting their uh, hour or their uh, asset allocation. I think it's now in states, really, I am seeing this move, mainly in pension funds, mainly in old demands on, on some giant networks, 
in Europe is still we are we are still late in, in, in the curve about that, but it's I'm strongly convinced that it will be the future. So do you think Europe will follow America eventually? Sorry? Yeah. Do you think Europe will follow America in their approach eventually? Yeah. Yeah. Great. Uh, thank you, Jack. Uh, right, Joe, over, over to you. Uh, do you believe investment management can ever be truly passive? I mean, I think the question's a ridiculous one, um, if I might say so. Um, I, I, you know, we, we've always been a strong believer that, um, you know, every decision you make is a, is a kind of active decision. You're not passively making, um, you know, a kind of decision. Um, and so, you know, when we, when we look at in terms of the development of the industry, we talk a little bit about, about limitations. Um, you know, I think both in terms of product development, um, as well as, um, as well as client usage, we're still really just touching the surface. Um, you know, and, and at the moment kind of ETFs and indexing have been, been used, you know, heavily by kind of multi-asset portfolio managers, whether they're sitting in the wealth managers or whether they're sitting in the institutional space, but we're absolutely seeing that pull out, <clears throat> um, and starting to being used by fixed income portfolio managers, you know, so people buying direct bonds are now starting to use fixed income ETFs to manage their liquidity, to manage their asset allocation. And the same on the equity side of things. Um, we're also starting to see a huge amount of usage, um, you know, by end retail clients. <clears throat> Jürgen spoke about the, the savings plan, which is particularly prominent in Germany. But if you're a retail client and you're faced with a list of a thousand European equity, um, you know, funds, <clears throat> how are you trying to work out which one's the best? You simply don't have time. And so I think there's a thing of it does what it says on the tin. Um, you know, with respect to ETFs. Um, and so they're becoming incredibly popular with retail clients. So I think, you know, we're only just touching the surface, both in terms of the, um, it's, sorry, in terms of the, the usage. The other thing I'd say is you think about the evolution um, of them and, you know, first things first was US equities and broad market exposures where people started to use, use ETFs. We've had this huge explosion in fixed income um, over, the last, over the last five, seven years. Um, and again, I think that's got huge legs to come. And now you've got an emergence of factors and sustainability. Um, you know, we estimate that <clears throat> between now and 2030, 1.2 trillion um, dollars will go into sustainable indexing, um, you know, from a base today of, of 100 billion. Um, you know, so you think about that growth as well. Um, you know, so I think we're just touching the surface with respect to, 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 to kind of indexing. The, the other thing I'd say is, um, you know, we, we absolutely believe in thinking about things from a portfolio approach. And I think gone are the days really where people chose the best 12 active managers, round them into a portfolio and kind of went from there. Um, you know, people have better systems now, they have better technology to, to analyze it. Um, and probably the most common, you know, when we're looking at clients' portfolios, probably the most common um, mistake that people actually make um, is we will look at a, a portfolio and all the, the managers independently are really, really good. Um, but when you combine them all together, you diversify away any alpha and you end up with a beta of one. So you can then replace it with an index. Um, and so I think hopefully over time as well, um, this equilibrium between, you know, kind of shifting from active into indexing will also start to kind of reverse back a little bit as people get more sophisticated about why they're actually choosing their alpha, um, whether it's the fee profile, which I think is an important consideration right now, but actually what is actually achieving for them in terms of the portfolio, um, rather than it just being, you know, like a cheaper conversation and I can, um, but actually really understanding what their, their active managers actually delivering for them. Thanks Joe. And so you mentioned um, the explosion in fixed income ETFs over the last five to seven years. Um, where do you see the next explosion in ETFs being? Is it sustainable? I know you obviously said sustainable. Yeah, indexes. absolutely. It's sustainable, sustainable, sustainable. And like whether it's versions of fixed income and sustainable together, but um you, you know the the throughout the last six months which have been an incredibly um you know volatile and difficult period um with respects to um you know kind of flows into the industry uh sustainable has been the beacon um that uh, so i think, I think we've seen 50 billion dollars um coming to sustainable etfs and actually what that has been um has been a larger portion of clients re-risking back into the sustainable versions of the, the ETFs or the index they used previously. Um, and, 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 and if you look at the performance of sustainable indices, 
um, you know, versus their parent industries, um, you know, a huge percentage of them um, has outperformed. And again, I, I mean, I don't think we're, we're not even touching the surface. We're not even there yet um, with respect to, you know, sustainable, um, you know, ETFs. And as I said, like the growth in sustainable um, is going to be um, absolutely huge. And, and a lot of times these things, I think, surprise people, you know, like a lot of times people overestimate in the short term um, and actually they disappoint. I think this is one of those things that like however much estimation we have and however much belief in sustainable we have in the short term, it continues to exceed even our expectations around this, um, which I think is uh, quite phenomenal uh, when you think about it. So I think everything is going to become, um, you know, sort of sustainable um, and we'll look back in 10 years time and, you know, that, like we won't move without producing something that looks or feels um, sustainable. Yeah, if I just may want to add um, one fact on that stuff that um, you mentioned obviously before the US and that they're usually front running the, the Europe. I think ESG is, is one of the only trends where I think Europe has um, a global position as a leader. And when I look at the assets in ESG ETFs globally, it's approximately 100 billion. And more than half of that um, is in European usage um, ESG ETFs. And um, that's very encouraging. And um, I think that regulation and the drive from, from the European Union and um, the Paris benchmarks and so on. So this, this all adds up to the fact that um, Europe is really the key driver of this topic globally. Thank you, Jürgen. Is that, yeah. Would anyone like to add anything else? Yeah, yeah, so just, but um, it's just a question to the, to the panel too. It, uh, uh, I understand the, the needs of the EAG on the development of the EAG. It's, uh, it's no brainer, okay? But uh, when we put sustainable in strategy, uh, people are thinking that it's perhaps less volatile or it's, it's more secure. It is wrong, okay? But in the terms of sustainability, perhaps people have that. Um, the overperformance of all the indices in, in sustainable index is mainly due to the overweighting of tech stocks. Massively. And um, if we have any accident in NASDAQ or something like that, do you think that we could have some mismatch in terms of perception between the sustainable slash sure environment of investments and the drawdown due to the overexposure to the tech stocks? What do you assume this kind of potential mismatch between the perceptions of on the reality that's or mainly 80% of the overperformance is coming from the overweighting in the tech stocks. Yeah, I mean, if I may, I mean, that's a, that's yeah. a, conference, it's a conference topic in its own right, whether we're going to have a, a correction and whether value investors come back. But I completely agree the main premise, which is that some of the ESG performance has been short term and it's a little hard to disentangle from that overweighting of tech and we shouldn't draw conclusions. But I completely subscribe to the idea that we've got probably a five year window in which um, the market is still relatively inefficient in, in relation to E, S and G. And I think I know that from my own experience with active management because our active managers are integrating ESG, but they're doing so in a way that fits their investment process. But within that debate, and even outside our firm in other firms of active managers, there are those who think it's um, political, uh, that it's not to do with generating returns or avoiding risk. So there, there is a really vigorous debate and a pretty substantial uh, body of investors who don't believe ESG is about alpha, it's about values. And I think we should respect that people want to express their values through their portfolio, that's absolutely fine. I think where we're thinking about it from a ESG integration perspective or from a product perspective, it's to deliver better returns um, and or lower risk. But I think once the market prices in, I think once the market becomes more mature, CFA is, you know, in a sense, homogenizing this. Once the market becomes mature in relation to ESG, the return premium might be, I don't want to say disappearing, but it will certainly be different um, in the future. And it's a relatively weak signal compared to the other things that drive uh, alpha. But we completely subscribe to the idea that, it, that investors should think about it carefully because it's one of those longer term sort of alphas that's often not looked at by many active managers. So it's worth having. 
Thank you, Richard. Um, right, over to, over to you again, uh, Jack. Um, question for you is, is it becoming harder for active managers to generate alpha? Um, this is a good cool question. <laughs> uh, a very good question. Honestly, it's just, um, uh, modestly, I try to reconciliate and to make a rapprochement between both. Okay, I, I manage a global macro strategy. I am a global macro guy. Um, since I started in 2012, I manage a global macro only in ETFs. Just to, to do, okay, we can do that. And I want to demonstrate that you can generate alpha with beta bricks. And, uh, on, and it's working well. And now we are, I'm plus 70% year to date. And, uh, and it's demonstrating that we can, even with the drawdown that, we, uh, that happened in the beginning of the year, we can have kind of absolute return strategy, global macro, uh, sustainable, I should say, in terms of, of performances. And it's working well. Now to generate alpha, it's, you know, it's, I think that the main definition to generate alpha is to, to have time. You know, in, in, the, in the current environment where we, are, we have Rubin Hooders and some guys just clicking on, on, some, on some apps to invest and with uh, high frequency traders uh, with, with uh, algorithm running at, uh, at, at the nanosecond, it just, um, I think that alpha need time to be developed. And um, um, it's, it's mainly also the inefficiency in the market, as Richard mentioned several times, it's, I think it's not only in the private or the illiquid assets, but it's also in, in the liquid assets on, on many of the markets. And uh, I think that's to, uh, it's more and more complicated because the ETF demonstrated in the bull run of every assets that's they are super efficient to to track the indices on its super vehicle to be invested in uh, um, but to generate alpha i think that the first step is to be very clear with the clients to say okay we need time no, don't make any arbitrage with our funds because it's on short term is not uh, is not sustainable and after to have a clear vision about why can, what kind of efficiency we want to play in the, in the alpha space. Uh, I think if you are clear on the both sides, we can generate alpha. For example, we initiate a kind of barbell approach, okay? Meaning that you can take, now with the central banks, you can take risk because you are, the, the central banks are floating money in, 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 in risky assets, I should say, on a deposit, the tail risk age are cheap. If you, if you buy the both on the same time, you are purely bubble, but long on the same time, you have quite efficient strategy at this stage. Generate alpha with that. And uh, I think that is always possible. After the big issue is that is, is like any industry, there is plenty of fashion and plenty of people cr are crowding some strategies, putting global macro everywhere or ETF everywhere. But I think it's important for the attendees to, you have uh, um, that the finance, it's an art on a science. Um, we cannot invest uh, uh, blindly in something because it's put they put global macro or they put each hedge funds or ETF and so on. We need an expertise and we need some kind of science to understand what, how an ETF is built, what are the metrics to take into account before to select an ETF. It's the same thing for the alpha. And um, I think it's uh, like, like uh, Churchill said, okay, uh, never waste a good crisis, okay? It's, it's full of opportunity. Uh, is yeah. is 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 many my main my main mantra okay and uh, and it's it was diffi it's difficult to generate alpha yes but it's strongly possible to generate alpha now really thank thank you for that Jay you made some really good good points is is would anyone else like to to add on the on the back of that of what Jack said. Not to um, 
Not to worry. We've actually had, before I come back to Richard, I've actually had a question from the audience for, um, for you, Jürgen, which is, uh, why do you think your, uh, Europe are leaders in sustainable, uh, sustainable investments? Yeah. So I think I have uh, three main uh, reasons for my opinion. Uh, so the first one is asset driven. So if I look into the ESG ETF space globally, as I said, approximately 100 billion are invested into ESG ETFs and more than half of that is into usage funds, which um, gives me some reasons to believe that um, obviously um, European investors have invested more into ESG uh, products than uh, American or Asian investors. The second one, uh, the second reason is driven from my experience um, talking to clients and we are a global ETF business, which means we are very well connected with our workmates in the US and in Asia as well. And um, from, from the client conversations in, in our uh, team calls, um, when, when we summarize those, um, I see that most of the time the topic ESG or sustainability comes up in Europe. It's uh, very rarely in the US and it's a little bit more often in Asia, but still not as frequently as in Europe. And the last reason is when I look into the headlines and I read that the EU, for example, um, has, has the whole program being spun around um, sustainability and um, being ESG focused in the future, then this gives me some evidence to, to believe that from the political will in Europe is, is largest um, to drive these topics uh, going forward. And when I look into the investor space, especially in the Nordics, in Benelux and in France as well, I think they are quite far advanced already when it comes to this topic. And I see a lot of pension funds, for example, um, where the boards um, give them um, specific limits which they have to achieve in ESG space. And that's why they invest very often in ESG funds or ESG ETFs uh, nowadays. So there's, there's definitely the, the political pressure, it's the regulatory pressure, and that's why I think Europe has the chance to lead in this space. Thank you, Jürgen. And um, just quickly, I know you touched on it and you said, so if the particular regions that you think are better within Europe investing sustainably. So obviously you mentioned France and the Nordics, where, where else would you yes, say? So, Bene so Benelux for me would be another region as well. Um, I yeah. think um, France has been one of the very early adopters. So we see that these rules have been implemented there very early. When we talk about the Nordics um, and, and Denmark as well, for example, um, those are the countries I think where most pension fund flows into ESG are happening at present. And they are often even seeding products. So they have specific demands and they come to ETF issuers and ask them to set up a product specifically and uh, which fulfills their criteria. And then they seed it with um, hundreds of millions or even more. And um, in, in Benelux as well. So when we talk to our um, team in the Benelux, um, almost all of our conversations are around ESG. I think, <clears throat> I think um, you know, like, pension funds is 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 kind of being done through regulation at the moment um the other area which i think is is um not as much discussed but a huge opportunity for the industry i think is retail clients or the end customer and um so if you think about the grassroots movements um behind climate change um you know people going to supermarkets with their own bags and their own tupperware chaining themselves to bridges and and roads and, and stopping printing press going. There, there is a huge amount of um, want and desire to do this um, and, and to make the world a better place. But when you start to ask them about what they're doing within their pension fund or within their ISAs, um, you know, that's when they don't necessarily have an answer. So I think if we can connect ESG and kind of this whole movement, we can bring a new breed of investors um, kind of into the industry. Um, and we're starting to see that with, you know, multi-asset um, ESG um, launches, which are kind of going to do it for you. So I think there's a huge opportunity here as well um, from the retail client base, not just within the institutional audience, um, you know, that are doing it for slightly different reasons. Um, but, I, but, but, but I think there's a huge ability there to connect the industry. Yeah, I fully agree with Joe. And um, maybe another data point is that when we look into the robot advisor space and they use ETFs heavily and um, they have put on ESG portfolios as well. So clients can choose when they get their money managed retail clients on a, on a robot platform and they can choose 100% ESG portfolios as well. Excellent. Do you think that um, either 
do you think it's like the new investors coming to the market as in the new demographic coming in that's changing this approach to the adoption of ESG or is it sort of well-established investors as well? I think it's both. I think it's, it's um, so, 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 either, so either you're creating a new proposition, um, mm. you are, so you, or you're um, integrating it into your existing proposition, um, or you're doing it because you have to from a regulatory perspective, or you're actually trying to attract a new breed of clients, um, you know, into the, uh, into the audience. So, so we just launched a, uh, an ESG multi-asset ETF, um, which the, the sole goal is to really bring in people into the industry and into investing that have never previously invested before, um, because we think that, you know, the whole um, the ESG can be an incredibly engaging, um, you know, kind of way to get people to think about their financial futures and how they're investing uh, in a way that we haven't been able to before uh, when we've been talking to them about returns and performance and various other things. But if we can talk to them about how are you allocating your pension, and your capital in a way that's doing good for the longer term, uh, we think that's a different conversation and a really good one to have uh, with the retail clients just because of the, um, the momentum that sits behind this uh, and how much people care about it in a way that, um, you know, they, they haven't cared about other things with respect to, um, investments. Yeah, I think I think if I can add to that. It is an area where there is a little bit more of a global a degree of global consistency. So if you look at the US, um, you've got wealth going down through the generations, um, and those new generations inheriting wealth have shown a you know increased tendency to apply their their values um, and their thinking to their investments. We know that there's a bit of a schism, isn't there, between Europe and US when it comes to ESG. I mean, at the official policy level um, that sort of runs through, uh, you know, the industry. But I think that, you know, notwithstanding some of the some of the efforts by policymakers to move in different directions, at the retail high net worth level, there is some degree of consistency across um, both sides of the Atlantic and even even out into um, other parts of the world. And I think what we've heard is that advisors want choice um, because they have a, a new generation of clients that are maybe talking in less familiar terms about things that matter to them. Uh, and therefore they need product providers, ETF providers, others to have investment ideas that make sense that they can put in front of them and, 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 and um, create portfolios that make sense to those clients. And some of them will be very impactful, active investments, you know, social, uh, related portfolios that are active, not necessarily the domain of um, ETFs at the moment. Um, but I think choice is key, certainly for advisors. That's what we're continuing to hear. Richard. Um, well, actually, I'm back to you now, Richard, anyway, with a, with a question for you. Um, what has the experience of the great financial crisis and the COVID market volatility taught us about active and index management? Yeah, it was... Um, a crisis like no ever other because it was a health crisis um, entangled in a sort of logistical crisis for the financial industry as well. Um, and I suppose, you know, apart from the obvious, we've, we've learned that we can actually operate. If, you, if you'd asked at the beginning of the year, you know, could you deal with the VIX at 70 or 80 and no liquidity in credit markets? And by the way, all your staff have to be at home. You, you know, that's, that's going to be a bit of a difficult environment. So we've learned that, but that's a... I don't want to trivialize that, but that's not necessarily the, the main point. Uh, what we've learned is the um, critical role that policymakers can have in stabilizing markets and what that implies for investors, both in the short term and the long term. Um, I think this time around, policymakers, and we engaged with a lot of them, they were super active um, and really turned the corner on the number of those uh, rather difficult moments, particularly in credit markets and funding markets. Um, in, in the space of a very short period of time. And they've utilized, interestingly, the kinds of things that many have advocated for, including ETFs. In other words, if you're gonna, you're gonna have an impact on markets, it's a really efficient and effective way to put capital to work, but also to uh, absorb some of the liquidity stresses that were in the market uh, during those last two weeks. I think with active management, uh, what have we learned? It accelerated some of the things that were uh, trends before, I mean, value clearly has been a, a challenge. And I think with the dearth of potential economic growth, people have rushed into uh, those 
growth premier stocks and price them as if that growth will continue forever. And I think that's probably a mistake. Like any crisis, you've thrown up the, the ball in the air um, and you know, you've shaken up valuations quite significantly. And from that crisis, um, there is a lot of opportunity, which again, sound, I apologize for it sounding like a cliche, but it really is true. Where you've got a real disconnect in prices um, there were very significant opportunities during the crisis for people to act, and we were engaging with our clients on that. But now, longer term, we've got the tendency of markets to extrapolate trends too far into the future. I'm not, I'm not having a go at growth stocks necessarily, but we're acting as if this is it forever, which really isn't, uh, isn't true at all, and, and you know, has a lot of potential for active management. But active management is different. Um, a lot of what it has done historically has been eroded by technology, uh, certainly in the sort of higher frequency type um, activity. Uh, and in the low frequency, it's got morphed in with ESG. I think that's a very healthy thing. Um, and I think required active managers to set out a very different proposition that's much more concentrated and very distinct from what they can have very cheaply through uh, index funds or exposure management strategies um, or ETFs. So I think we've, we've learned a lot it's an accelerated development um and i think it's not the end at all for, for the for the investment industry in terms of learning uh, how it can get better so long as it doesn't look at itself and looks at its customers and said what what do the customers need how do the customers need to manage their liquidity and volatility uh, and doesn't think about itself first and foremost as a as a machine to generate revenue for itself uh, so i i think that that's happening um and I think it's very healthy. Thank you, Richard. Um, would anyone, anyone like to add on, on, on Richard's answer? Sorry, can I just add one more thing? The, the, yeah, of course. There were persistent doubts about ETFs and Jacques expressed some of the kind of concerns about ETFs. Uh, we heard them through the GFC. We heard them when the energy sector collapsed um, a few years back with the high yield um, crisis in the cash market every time we had a test uh regulators really looked closely as well as customers of etfs and they appeared to pass that test i say appeared you know there'll be anomalies with levered products and kind of odd we're re, you know reverse levered products but the ones that people were most concerned about particularly around credit um they perform well because they provided a, a, a safety valve for investors and liquidity rushed to ETFs. It was actually very hard to trade in cash bonds. Um, I mean, you could trade in cash bonds, but it was certainly difficult. And as many have commentated, ETF pricing really led the market. So if you want to know where investors really thought high yield spread should be, you look at the ETF. You don't, you don't look at the cash bond, which was a stale price. Um, I think still there's confusion because of the disconnect between cash and ETF prices. And people say, well, that shows there's something a little bit wrong. Uh, I think what it shows is you've got cash markets that are in some respects, in some corners of fixed income, still in the dark ages in terms of trading technology and also capital provision because of regulation post GFC. So I guess they, they passed that test yet again. And so one hopes that some of the doubts and concerns about ETFs would now be allayed. Thanks Richard. Um, right, over, over to you, uh, Jürgen. Uh, do you expect the ETF market to continue to grow? And if so, how will it remain profitable? Um, so before I answer, just uh, thank you very much, Richard, uh, for these points. Um, fully stand behind them and, and fully agree to those. But now, uh, Sebastian, coming to your question, so the short answer is yes. Um, but uh, let me give you some figures why we think that the market will grow. And I yeah. want to give you some um, thoughts on profitability as well. So starting with some figures, I think the ETF industry globally has 7 trillion in the US, we see 5 trillion of those in 40 act funds. In Europe now, we are at a record level of 1.2 trillion in our usage products and the rest is in Asia, which by the way is the smallest but fastest growing market um, for, for ETFs. And so percentage wise, and uh, when I look at the NNA figures here to date, in Europe, we see 65 billion US dollar of fresh money being invested into ETFs, and mainly into gold and US dollar and Euro corporate bonds. 
And it looks like we are on pass for the second year in a row where more inflows happen in bond ETFs, which um, underlines the point which Cho made before as well, that the bond ETF market becomes more and more important um, for, the, for the global ETF market in total. We saw net outflows for emerging market bonds and emerging market equities. There are some exceptions. For example, Chinese bonds saw massive inflows. And it's a very impressive figure to know that globally, on average, um, at present, every month, 40 billion US dollar of net new assets get invested into the ETF space. So there's clearly a strong trend, and there's no reason to believe that this should um, collapse now. We think this trend continues. So let's come to the second point. Will, will it remain profitable? And that's obviously a very interesting point. Um, maybe again to start with the, the total revenue in Europe for ETF issuers is roughly 3 billion US dollar. The profit obviously is unknown and it's a, it's a scale industry where not all issuers are profitable. So you need scale uh, to have um, profitability because you need some specific functions, you need some um, specific teams, you need some specific technology um, to be able to operate in this market. And I think the race to zero is often discussed and we see now issuers um, issuing products which are very low cost. And we, when we look at the majority of inflows, they are happening into products which are sub 10 basis points. Um, I would have a mixed view on this race to zero. Um, I think that um, race to zero is just possible if you as a company can gain additional revenue streams in other areas. And this can be on the custody side or can be on the trading side. Um, but um, it's, it's not possible um, for all products um, to end up in the zero um, management fee space. And I, I think um, as well for, for blockbuster products, when I think about S&P 500 or Eurostoxx 50 products or global bond products, there are enough established products already which have more than 10 billion or sometimes even more than 100 billion in assets under management. And we do not see that just because there's now a product with one basis point or zero basis points, that the assets switch from the five, five basis point fund into the zero basis point fund. I think that the, the cost levels have, to, have, to, have come down so much that um, by now uh, the people are well aware of the tickers, of their preferences, and they will not switch um, for maybe three, four basis points into a product uh, which has less track record, which is smaller, and which, which they are less aware of. So I think these, these big products, um, 10 billion, 100 billion, um, they will um, continue to attract money. And when we talk about product innovation, I think that's another trend which obviously stands against this uh, race to zero. Um, I have not seen any ESG product which has zero TR. And when we think about this trend into thematic products, no matter if it's cloud computing or maybe Bitcoin or um, other topics which really attract money, um, they all have um, a management fee, which makes it possible for ETF issuers um, to um, generate revenue and to generate a profit as well. So that's why I think the ETF market will continue to grow. And um, I do not think that we end up in the future in an environment where all the products are um, at zero TR. Thank you, Jürgen. Uh, but we're very interested to hear other views as well, especially from, from the ETF managers, um, what, what your views are. Yeah, guys, would you like to? I think in the, um, you know, I, I, I think there's been a lot of conversations um, you know, probably probably two to two to five years ago around pricing, um, and I think some of the new players that came into the European market, um, kind of from the US, um, you know, and and you know, I think the European market had been in an interesting place because it had um, you know either some bank owned ETF providers um, uh, and kind of iShares, and then you know sort of players came in from the US. Um, and I think there was two or three years where kind of the industry repriced itself to probably where it is today. Um, and that was quite aggressive at the time. Uh, but I do feel now um, it's kind of reached a little bit of an equilibrium and things will move around a little bit. Um, but I think we actually have now developed the conversation into something a little bit more interesting and moved on to, you know, kind of um, focus on other things other than whether the S&P 500 ETF is a, 
five, six or seven basis points. Um, you know, because, um, you know, given the, 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 the sort of slippage you might see with respect to, um, you know, trading or custody or systems or whatever it may be, um, it actually matters, you know, far less than I think we probably thought it did within the industry. Um, so I'm really pleased to see the industry move on, uh, not focus so much on price, um, you know, focus on what you're getting, the value, um, and some of the other parts of the value chain, uh, which I think are, um, you know, far more important if you want to reduce the price of your offering. If I may, I, I just pray that we will never see a zero TR ETF. Honestly, it just I am, it, it just I, I am not paid by State Street or, or BlackRock. Okay, just but I think I think that I think that uh, uh, when a client stops to pay fees, he stops to be a client. Point. We will see this in the future. Uh, I'm afraid in in, in, cl in close future with Rubin Hood and so on, when people can trade for free, but it's not free at the end. Okay, it's fake. Um, in some way, some guys are 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 are, are receiving plenty of, of of money because they sold their flows on. There is some front run stuff on some bad stuff back. There is bad stuff behind that, okay? But I pray that we will keep, I send a kind of equilibrium in terms of TR, because definitely we, we have to pay the access to. A TR is just only uh, uh, asset management, is the access to have this kind of uh, luck or luxury to have this diversity in terms of underlying, in terms of access. Now, uh, I, I think that it would be more interesting for the ETF providers to go to Asia to have the same uh, granularity that we have in the States, for example. I cannot buy uh, a Chinese pharma ETF. This is the second or the first economy in the world. I cannot buy sectors in Chinese stocks, for example, or very or small, uh, a small part of. Okay? Just that. And I think that there is... A, Tons of new ETFs should come from Asia to just to address this kind of um, granularity and to, to down to more accurate asset allocation. Uh, but honestly, I, I, I really pray that the fight to down, down, down the fees will stop because at the end, we will have a disaster uh, in, in, in this space if we continue this kind of game. You know, it's... Uh, when you stop to pay in, in industry fees, you know that the industry needs to survive and they find a way to hide some stuff on, at the end. Something happened in the markets on the regulation, on geopolitics and so on, on everything's blood. Some interesting points there raised there. Thank you, Jack. Um, so over to you, Joe. I think we have time for two more questions. I'm just checking the Q&A and nothing else has come in yet. So, um, uh, Joe, what are the benefits of active management over passive management? Um, you know, I think, <clears throat> I think it's, an, it's, a, um, it's an individual decision at an individual time. And I don't think, you know, you can, you can make broad brush statements, um, you know, kind of about the you know, the difference between the two. And so um, depending on the outcome you're trying to achieve, um, it may make sense to use, by the way, a host of different tools like active and indexing are just a couple of tools that, or ETFs are just a couple of tools that, that investors should have in their inbox, um, you know, in terms of that. I think, I think the other thing that, I, that I'd really say is a kind of the, the, the growth of indexing. Um, there's a couple of comments that I think get, get thrown out. One is, um, you know, now should be the time for active management. Uh, and we hear this every six to, uh, you know, however many months, I think it's always a time for active management. Um, you know, and I think um, sometimes your style of investing may not be in vogue for the markets. Um, but I, I do believe that talented individuals will always be able to um, outperform uh, over the medium and long term. The, the second thing I, I, I would also say is actually, I think indexing has been incredibly good for uh, the active management industry. And I think um, a couple of things that happened within the active industry, firstly, it just got too large with too many portfolio managers. 
um, not all of which um, could actually deliver alpha uh, on a sustainable long-term basis. Um, and the second thing was actually a lot of the active managers had been very much kind of um, curtailed or, or sort of controlled, um, you know, either use in institutional um, pension funds, but they're almost being asked by clients um, to almost run beta like so very, very low volatility, quite close to the benchmark type solutions. Um, you know, and I think the whole thing around indexing and the development of that, or even the whole thing around, you know, some of the things around smart beta or alternative beta um, has actually led for the active industry to, to reevaluate why it's there and what it's trying to do, um, you know, and become a lot more concentrated, um, take risk and, and, and give the, these very talented, um, you know, stock pickers the ability to actually go and do that. Um, uh, you know, so I think, I think indexing has actually been a real blessing, um, you know, for the active management industry as we look forward. Yeah. And, um, we've actually just had a question from the audience, uh, guys, so all feel free to, to jump in. It says, uh, do you think the active side will disappear over the next 10 years? <laughs> I don't think so. I think there's a, there's a need for, or a desire for extra return. Okay. Step back and say it's a zero sum game. But there are, there are investors who want or need extra returns. And to the extent the market's not fully efficient, yes, there'll be, there'll be a demand. It'll, it'll change in the next 10 years. Um, it'll become more specialized. Some things will be automated or turned into systematic um, strategies rather than specifically alpha strategies. But I see a lot of scope for active management. And not just actually, in con I mean, we do a lot of concentrated because that's, an area that I think is important and distinguishes from active. But just think about how much you pay in fees to get another 50 or 100 basis points over the benchmark. You might say, well, that's, that's not active. That's sort of fake active. I'm, I'd still be happy to pay 10 basis points to get 50 or 100 over the broad benchmark. That's value for money. So I think the question is, what, how does the active innovate in response to uh, indexing? Um, and I think there's plenty of opportunity. Um, and so quickly, one more question from the audience is, uh, compared to, uh, to say 10 years, 10, 20 years time with all the increase in political pressure and regulations, is it reasonable to say e uh, ESG as a whole um, are undervalued at this point in time? Maybe if I may take the first opinion on that. Um, so we yeah. have clients who believe exactly that. And it will be interesting to see if, um, if you expect these money flows into stocks which have a very positive ESG profile, then because of this, these expected money flows, if they will outperform. Or, for example, a second reason could be true as well, that because of political and regulatory pressure, that, they, that their business will flourish more in the future because it will get more government contracts or um, investors or consumers have to consume their products more often. So I, I can definitely see this point. Um, I have not seen academic research on that, but this would be very interesting, I think, to have a deep dive from an academic level as well. Uh, if I may to build the bridge between the both question, it's uh, yeah. uh, honestly, I, I don't think so. The AG are undervalued. I know that there is a lot of regulation pressure on so on, but you know, it's, uh, you remember me, uh, the ISR in France in 2007, it was the same, the same, the same fashion uh, in investments. And trust me, in 2008 and 2009, no one talked about the ISR. Okay, it's, it was, we had some more issue to solve. Um, and now there is a huge fashion about the AG. Because honestly, when you are an active manager, if you select a stocks without to take into consideration, uh, obviously the, um, the, 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 the S on the G, you have to be fine. Okay. It's just, uh, it's just base of your, of your, of your business. Um, I think that the active management is cheaper regarding the, 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 um, the, the passive one, if I put kind of risk premium, okay? We are, we are over in the overextension of the bull market now on, uh, in over asset classes. And I think that to pay attention to pass to active should be, could be interesting now in this space. Mm -hmm.